there still is in me this instinctive reaction that's like, look, why do we need assault weapons in this world? Why do, why do private citizens need to have access? Why can't we just ban assault weapons, high capacity, um, uh, uh, you know, cartridges? Uh, it serves no, it serves no pers uh, purpose. There's other ways to protect innocent lives uh, other than, you know, giving people access to these weapons. Start with that just simple um, yeah. policy proposal. Why, why, what, what greater complexity do I need to grasp um, from believing that that's a common sense and uh, and like a biblically mandated or a biblically encouraged at least position to protect innocent lives and put the priority on protecting innocent lives? Well, one of the things we have to do is we have to cut through some language here. So the phrase assault weapons is inherently loaded to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, if you're going to say do... Are weapons of war, in other words, the, like the weapon I carried in Iraq, is that available mm -hmm. on the marketplace? No, it is not. Okay. Now, I, I possess a version of what I carried in Iraq, but it is not what I carried in Iraq. It has no, it has no uh, capacity for fully automatic gunfire. So it, what I carried in Iraq had it's three settings, safe, single shot, in other words, uh, semi-auto, safe, semi, and burst. So I could, on the gun I carried in Iraq, it would fire, it could fire three round bursts, uh, and as well as semi-automatic and semi-automatic for people who don't know is firing every time you pull the trigger. Well, firing every time you pull the trigger is the single most common way that rifles are designed. It's the single most common way that handguns are designed. So when you talk about assault weapon, what are you talking about? Well, you're usually talking about a rifle that works the way all other rifles work, but looks military style and has a detachable magazine, okay? Now, um, well, that's again, the way most rifles are, <laughs> is they have a detachable magazine. So then you say, well, what about the magazine size? Okay, got it. Well, um, when we talk about as large capacity magazines, we're often talking about what are actually, another phrase to use, a standard capacity, the normal size magazine that comes with a weapon of that type. And the the Supreme Court has an interesting way of phrasing the 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 ex, sort of the, the the nature of weapons that are encompassed by uh, the Second Amendment, and it's guns in common use for a lawful purpose. Okay, you don't get more common than the AR-15. It's hard to find. It's the most common rifle in circulation in the United States. Period. The estimate is around 20 million of them in circulation. And so, and the, what rifles do is they actually kill fewer people per year in gun deaths than um, fists. Um, people are, more people are beaten to death than are killed by rifles in the U.S., um, murdered by rifles. So it's not commonly used for criminal purposes. It's extremely commonly used for lawful purposes. Um, same with semi-automatic handguns. And so what is it that, what value does here exist? What, what is the underlying value that say, for example, the second amendment exists to protect? And the underlying value is um, the right of self-defense and the defense of others. That's the underlying value. And um, the way I've put it to people is that value is meaning is only protected if it's protected in a meaningful way. And the way I've put it is against foreseeable threats. And it's no secret my family has been under threat off and on for uh, seven solid years. And if I think about what is the threat that I will face, what is the threat that I will face? It is a threat of a, a gun that's in common use. <laughs> What are the guns that are in common use? They're semi-automatic firearms. That's the gun that's in common use. And so I think anytime you're talking about restricting a gun that's in common use for a lawful purpose, um, what you're talking about is restricting for law-abiding people the weapon uh, a weapon that would be the equivalent of what they will almost certainly face if they ever face a threat to their lives. And so um, I'm fully on board with banning and or sharply limiting weapons that are of 
not common use for lawful purposes. So very large capacity magazines like were used in the Aurora mass shooting or fully automatic weapons or things like that. They're not in common use for a lawful purpose. Let, they should be heavily, heavily regulated. But if a gun isn't a common use for a lawful purpose, um, then the problem that you have is if you restrict it for the law abiding, you're not doing really anything to restrict it for the criminal class because what we know is they don't obtain their guns lawfully. Mass shooters are a separate category. We can deal with that. But uh, people who use guns to commit violent crime are obtaining weapons unlawfully, overwhelmingly. And so the restrictions on lawful purchase don't necessarily implicate what you're going to face with a, uh, with a criminal. And then if you look at the RAND study of studies, um, there's not a lot of evidence that these kinds of things make a difference um, to the underlying challenge they're trying to address. But David, you know, I hear what you're saying there. It strikes me that it's, it feels a little bit like you're saying, look, because there's a lot of guns out there that could do a lot of damage, I need to have a lot of guns out there that could do equivalent level of damage. And, and we're back to the level of, that, well, okay, if there's a lot of guns out there, then we need to arm people with a lot of guns of a certain caliber and type and, and, and function and so forth. But doesn't this put the conversation back to, well, why don't we just try to get less guns out there? Like, actually, you can't circ get around the fact that, you know, just focusing on behavior and not trying to limit the availability of guns, uh, you know, that that has to be considered as part of the solution. Because even why you're saying why, you, you might need a gun is because there's a lot of other guns in circulation. So shouldn't we be attacking this both from behavior and that's, both from availability? That's not precisely. So for example, it's not just the a lot of guns, it's that criminals have guns, okay? Mm -hmm. That's not exactly the same thing. So for example, um, if you look at murder rates around the world, um, there are many countries in the world with much higher murder rates than ours. Mm -hmm. And every last one of them has much lower gun ownership rates, much lower. So if you look across Latin America, which has uh, tons of countries across Latin America have much higher murder rates than the United States, they, every one of them, every one of them has way lower gun ownership rates. So it's, it isn't just sort of this one-to-one -one thing that says more guns equals more crime. It is much more of a what do, how do criminals behave <laughs> is kind of, is a really big part of the equation. And so it isn't just, that's one of the things that I think gets really um, lost in a lot of this is we sort of say, well, we're awash in firearms and that's why we're awash in gun violence. Or we're awash in firearms and that's why we have high suicide rates. When you can go across the world and find nation after nation after nation with much lower gun ownership rates and much higher and, and higher rates of violent crime and higher rates of suicide. Russia, for example, has very low private gun ownership rates, has very high homicide rates, and has very high suicide rates. South Korea has microscopic gun ownership, but very high suicide. And so a lot of the issue here isn't so much, well, it's just like math. <laughs> the more guns you have uh, in the population, the more crime you have. It's a lot of it's about behavior of, um, you know, behavior of and means and methods and use of by the criminal class and society. And it's not necessarily tied to percentage of gun ownership, like how many people have guns. Even if you break it down in American demographics, it is not the case that the demographic of Americans who owns the most guns commits the most crime. That's not the way it works at all. And so that's why it gets really, and, that, and again, that's why if you're gonna look at these studies of, for example, the efficacy of restrictions on guns themselves, the evidence is non-existent with mass shootings and very iffy on uh, violent crime overall as to the efficacy of any given gun regulation. Um, it's because it's, it's aimed at something that isn't necessarily the actual problem, if that makes sense. 